shocking moment, a train slammed into a police cruiser with a woman handcuffed and under arrest inside. She survived, but now an officer is on leave as authorities investigate. Monster storm threat. Hurricane Fiona battering Bermuda and heading north tonight, causing dangerous surf up and down the East Coast. And the new system now strengthening in the tropics that could be on a collision course with Florida. Rob Marciano is tracking it all. Russia's sham referendums. The votes underway to annex parts of Ukraine. And Putin putting his latest plan in motion, handing out draft papers to build back his military. And tonight, a closer look at horrors of Izium. The new evidence of alleged Russian atrocities. Mass graves discovered after the Russian retreat that are now a crime scene. People who died in your apartment block are buried in the forest. How does that make you feel? I feel awesome. Nothing. Nothing. Every day we saw bodies, parts of bodies. I feel nothing. The NBA coach suspended for the entire season by the Boston Celtics amid allegations about an inappropriate relationship with a woman inside the organization. What the team officials said today. Guns in America. As mass shooters seek out soft targets, the cutting-edge scanners designed to detect weapons powered by artificial intelligence and protecting everything from schools to Six Flags amusement parks. So how effective are they? And as we continue reporting on Hispanic Heritage Month, the new push to address the mental health crisis among Latinos, with stars like Selena Gomez using their own platforms to offer safe spaces online, helping others open up and break the taboo. There are more Latina creators out there that are talking about their own mental health struggles. That provides more of a connection and safety for other people. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin this Friday night tracking the now very active tropics. Our weather team is monitoring a threat forming in the Caribbean that could be taking aim at the Florida coast next week. More on that in just a moment, but first, Hurricane Fiona has remained a monster storm. After hammering Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, it has now set its sights on Bermuda. The storm's eye passed about 100 miles from the island, plunging about half of it into darkness. Residents are sheltered inside until tomorrow. And now the storm is poised to strike a historic blow on Canada. At this hour, it's barreling up the Atlantic Ocean and set to strike our neighbors to the north with record force. Halifax, Nova Scotia tonight is under an extremely rare hurricane warning. And while Fiona spared the U.S. mainland, that new tropical threat could could become a major hurricane and it may head straight for Florida. ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano rode out Fiona in Bermuda but now has his eye on the new potential threat for the U.S. mainland as much of Florida is under a state of emergency. Tonight, Fiona lashing Bermuda. The storm slamming the British territory this morning as a strong Category 3 hurricane. Boats are becoming unmoored left and right. Here's another one. There's a couple of boats that flat out sank over there. We're in the teeth of Fiona now. Crews racing to restore power. At one point, 70% of the island without electricity. Looking at what is broken, what can be fixed uh, immediately uh, just to get everybody back on. Hurricane force winds extending 115 miles from the center of Fiona. Now the strongest hurricane this far north on record. Fiona bringing big waves and rip currents up and down the east coast and putting Canada's coast in its crosshairs. Officials there warning residents to prepare. This storm is going to hit us, folks. It's going to hit us in the face. And so we have to be ready. In Fiona's wake, more than 800,000 still without power in Puerto Rico five days after landfall. And now a new storm is threatening Florida. Hurricane hunters flying through TD9 today, Florida declaring that state of emergency for much of the state. There is no time like now to prepare. Residents taking heed, filling sandbags and fueling up. It's now forecast to become a major hurricane next week. Everyone needs to be on alert and certainly can't take this lightly. Rob Marciano joins us now from Bermuda. Rob, you are tracking Fiona and that rare threat to Canada tonight, but also the new threat in the tropics that could slam Florida. 
Yeah, a lot to talk about, uh, Stephanie. Let's first talk about Fiona. I should also mention that uh, uh, this storm is the farthest category four storm, farthest north on record, and certainly climate change is playing a role here. We got water temperatures here in the North Atlantic, two to four degrees above average, and nearly that in the Caribbean as well. All right, Fiona is now about 350 miles from Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's looking less like a hurricane. It's becoming extra tropical on the satellite picture, but that doesn't mean it's weakening. It's still a category three storm with 125 mile per hour winds. We have hurricane warnings posted for Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. That's rare. And a high wind warnings up for northern Maine as well. So still very windy conditions and potential damage for the U.S. and certainly a damaging storm for Atlantic Canada throughout the day tomorrow. Tropical depression number nine becoming more organized in the central Caribbean. We have tropical storm watches and hurricane watches for the Cayman Islands and Jamaica. We expect it to become a tropical storm. Its name would be Ian tomorrow. Likely a hurricane by Monday night, then crossing Cuba into the Gulf of Mexico. We look for it to continue to strengthen because it's uh, got a lot of warm water and moist air and unstable air at ahead of it. Potentially a major storm coming into western Florida Wednesday night, maybe Thursday. And there are some of the water temperatures. We need 80 degrees to keep a hurricane going. 85, obviously, it's going to pump it up. 90 plus like we're seeing in the northwestern Caribbean that could possibly lead to explosive growth. Everyone in Florida should be on alert. This is what the computer models are saying right now and they are locked on to Florida but really Florida to Louisiana the, the uh, Carolinas as well. We got to see where this thing goes. One thing's for sure is that it's going to be a formidable storm here and it's going to strike the U.S. next week. Stephanie. It's not looking good. We know you'll continue to track it all for us. Rob good to see you. Please be safe. Now to the war in Ukraine, where this week Russia has dramatically raised the stakes. First, Putin's new military draft that has resulted in some Russian men trying to flee their own nation instead of fighting for it. At the same time, Russian-led referendums are being held in occupied parts of Ukraine with the goal of taking illegally seized territories for their own. President Biden is among the world leaders calling it a sham, but there could be some consequences. Here's ABC's Tom Sufi Burge in Kharkiv. Tonight, Kremlin-style door-to-door voting, soldiers armed with assault rifles escorting voting officials with ballot boxes in their hands. Ukrainian officials posting these videos showing what the U.S. calls sham referendums in Russian-occupied Ukraine. With Vladimir Putin planning to declare those regions part of Russia, the White House warning it will respond. We are prepared to impose additional swift and severe economic costs on Russia. Moscow threatening any attack on newly annexed regions would be considered an attack on Russia. A U.S. official today confirming to ABC News the U.S. has been sending private warnings to Moscow about the consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. Vladimir Putin took a massive gamble when he invaded Ukraine, wrecking large parts of this country. But by bringing in a military draft in Russia, he is upping the stakes again. With the new draft in motion, Russians rushing for the exit. Traffic jammed at the Russian border with Finland. The mere idea of being drafted causing panic. And emotional scenes with Russians hugging and kissing their newly drafted loved ones goodbye. Ruslan, an IT specialist, paying $1,700 for a one-way ticket out, the flight usually costing $250. And tonight, two U.S. military veterans who fought for Ukraine and were captured and held by Russian forces for months, now freed in a prisoner swap, back in the U.S., speaking out for the first time. We're looking forward to spending time with family, and we'll, we'll be in touch with the media soon. Yeah, good, happy to be home. And it's good to have those veterans back on U.S. soil safely. Tom Sufi Burge joins us from Kharkiv. And Tom, I want to go back to those scenes from the Russian staged referendums in Ukraine. Soldiers going door to door with officials in some areas. When will we learn how those people voted? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, these bizarre scenes of election officials accompanied by soldiers going to people's homes could play out over the next five days when so-called voting is taking place. One Ukrainian official saying Russian soldiers are effectively using the barrel of their gun to show people where to put their tick. President Biden saying the U.S. will never recognize that territory as being anything other than Ukraine. Stephanie. Incredible. Thank you so much, Tom, for your reporting. We'll have more from Tom in Ukraine a little later in the show.
Back here at home, we're now seven weeks to the midterm elections, and today Republicans unveiled their agenda, calling it the commitment to America, as they hope to regain control of the House in November. So what does the agenda cover and what's not included? Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, with just 46 days before the midterm elections, House Republicans unveiling what they call their commitment to America. The plan introduced by the man who wants to replace Nancy Pelosi as speaker. The next speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Thank you, my friend. McCarthy and his colleagues zeroing in on the economy as their driving issue, saying that's what voters really care about. We heard the same thing, kitchen table to dining room table to inside the factory. Can I afford it? Can I afford to fill up my tank? Can I afford the food, the milk? He talked about rising crime, the immigration crisis. Who has a plan to change that course? We do. The Democrats have no plan for the problem they created. Actually, what Republicans rolled out today, notably light on details. No concrete policy proposals for tackling these issues. That's a, a thin series of policy goals with little or no detail that he says Republicans are going to pursue if they regain control of the Congress. Here's a few of the things we didn't hear. We didn't hear him mention the right to choose. Abortion barely mentioned in today's Republican plan, and not at all at today's event. Democrats seized on the issue after the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade. So in 46 days, America's going to choose. If Republicans win control of the Congress, abortion will be banned. Democrats are hoping for a repeat of what recently happened in Kansas, the conservative state voting overwhelmingly to protect abortion rights. The big question, will the issue rise to the top when voters head to the polls in just a few weeks? We shall see. We are just a few weeks away indeed. Rachel Scott joins us now from Washington. Rachel, along with that Kansas vote, the debate over abortion access has seemed to have a big impact on voting already in the midterms. What are you seeing? Yes, Stephanie, Democrats are really seeing that this energizes their base. They're looking at some of the special elections that happened this past summer. Not only what happened in Kansas, where abortion was on the ballot, a conservative state overwhelmingly voted to protect abortion rights, but also in a New York special election, a swing district where the candidate there, Pat Ryan, ran on the issue of abortion rights. He ended up winning that special election. And we do have new data that shows that more women are registering to vote in these key battleground states. It could make a very very big difference this midterm election staff it certainly could we will be watching thanks so much rachel good to see you for more on the gop agenda let's go now to abc's Brittany shepherd who attended today's event in pittsburgh and spoke with house minority leader kevin mccarthy Brittany, good to see you uh, we heard rachel say there that the speech was light on details but just outlined for us what pillars mccarthy and republicans say they hope to focus on if they take back control of the house so, Stephanie, like you said, we've got four main pillars. We have the economy, safety, individual liberty, and government accountability, and that's pretty much it. These are big-picture ideas that are mostly a referendum on the Biden agenda writ large with a couple of details, a few promises, including uh, having a parent's bill of rights in schools, putting more police on the southern border, and repealing a few IRS agents that the Biden administration put over in the last year or so. A lot of this is a North Star for Republicans who right now feel that they need a rebrand after the the division of the primaries and it's a time for McCarthy and his caucus to kind of get their house in order but we don't have as many details of how would they get any of this passed with Democrats ho hosting the White House and Democrats holding the Senate and the clock of course is ticking former President Trump of course still dominating the conversation for the GOP and we've also seen his influence with so many election denying candidates on the ballot now you asked McCarthy about that what did he have to say Fortunately, Stephanie, not much of anything. He said that the voters on the trail and voters at the event today are focused on pocketbook issues, on, folk, on issues that crunch their wallet, on inflation, gas prices, and grocery store prices. And some of that's true. I was just hitting the trail in Wyoming and speaking to people in the room today, and they are animated against those issues. And there is some unity in the GOP between what's happening on the border and with crime. But if McCarthy wants a big tent, he's going to have to concede with about 6% of Americans who are going to be faced with some kind of election denier at some part of the Republican ticket. It was pretty stunning today walking around this event behind McCarthy and uh, Republican leaders.
leadership. You see a Republican who voted to impeach Donald Trump and is going to be retiring in New York. And to his right, Rep. Marjorie Taylor Greene, perhaps the most conservative of conservative members of his caucus. If he wins the majority and becomes de facto speaker come November, he is going to have to concede with how to deal with perhaps to be at least a dozen election deniers or folks who are skeptical and hope to relitigate the last election in his new caucus. Good thing is we'll get a chance to see how exactly voters are swayed. All right, Brittany Shepard for us. Thank you so much. And next week in Washington, we'll see the return of the January 6th Select Committee with a new planned hearing on Wednesday. So tonight, we'll have an in-depth special recapping their work so far. The committee, the attack on the Capitol, the investigation. That premieres tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, and it's also streaming later on Hulu. Well, an amended autopsy report has now been released in the death of Elijah McClain after he was stopped by police while walking home in 2019 in Colorado. The report now says the 23-year-old black man died likely from too much of a sedative injected in him by paramedics. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Tonight, a Colorado coroner's office has released an updated autopsy report for Elijah McClain, the unarmed black man who died in police custody as he walked home from the store. After a review of grand jury evidence in the case, the Adams County Chief Coroner amending the cause of death from undetermined to, quote, complications of ketamine administration following forcible restraint. Aurora police stopped McLean in August of 2019 after they got a 911 call about a, quote, sketchy person. The 23-year-old's family says he wore a ski mask because his anemia often left him cold. Your favor, stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Stop. 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 Police body camera footage shows officers struggling to detain McLean, using a carotid control hold on him after claiming he tried to grab one of their guns. I can't breathe. I'm just I'm so sorry. your gun, dude. I have no that's good. Where I, that's where I try karate. I don't do that stuff. Paramedics later injecting McLean with ketamine, a powerful sedative. He stopped breathing and died three days later. Tonight, the coroner writing, quote, the dosage of ketamine was too much for this individual and it resulted in an overdose. Thank you so much for that report, Mark. It's good to have some answers. Disturbing images out of Colorado tonight after a police cruiser was struck by a train while a woman was in the back seat. The officer is now on leave. A warning, these images are disturbing. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Opti. The moments captured on this hard pounding body camera footage tonight under investigation. Police in Colorado seen responding to a suspected road rage complaint involving a gun, pulling over 20 year old Yareni Rios Gonzalez. Keep your hands above your head. Don't move. What's going on? They handcuffed her and walked her to a police cruiser. Where are you taking me? We're taking you to the car. But that car is sitting on train tracks. Take a seat. And as officers go search her truck for weapons, an oncoming train is sounding its horn. Who is, is that heart? At first, the officer seemingly unaware. The moment is difficult to watch. Oh my God. Oh my God. Move your car. Stay back. Another officer seen getting out of the way right before the train slams into that cruiser. That cruiser, a mangled wreck. The suspect was in the vehicle that was hit by the train. Somehow, Rios Gonzalez survived but suffered serious injuries. Just incredible that that woman survived. Mona joins us now. Mona, we're glad to hear that the woman is okay, but any idea what the extent of her injuries are? Stephanie, I just spoke with her lawyer, and he tells me that she is still in the hospital. Rios Gonzalez suffered a broken arm, ribs, and a fractured sternum. Now, a state investigation is currently underway, and at least one officer involved has been placed on administrative leave. Stephanie. Thanks so much, Mona, for that update. The Boston Celtics have suspended head coach Ime Udoka for the entire upcoming season for what has been described as a consensual relationship with a woman within the organization that violated team policies. Celtics officials today defended their decision and said the investigation began in July. Udoka, who led the Celtics to the NBA Finals in his first season, apologized in a statement to the team and his family and said he accepts the decision.
When we come back, the new warning as investigators try to control the amount of rainbow fentanyl coming into college campuses. And she's one of the biggest stars in the world, and she's embroiled in a major tax evasion case. The evidence, Shakira says, will prove her innocence. Mass graves and traumatized survivors. That's what's left behind in a Ukrainian city after it was temporarily under Russian control. Tom Sufi Burridge has a haunting report from Izium. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Back to the war in Ukraine, where tonight a U.N.-appointed panel has issued a damning statement concluding Russia has committed war crimes with victims as young as four. As Ukrainian forces have regained control of territory in the east, they are finding scenes of horror. That's most evident in the city of Izium, where the only thing more haunting than the mass graves are the shell-shocked survivors left behind to pick up the pieces, as ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge saw firsthand. We must warn you that some of the images you are about to see are disturbing. It is a chilling scene. Endless lines of crosses in a forest. And there is little dignity for the dead here. Very few of the graves have names. These graves here are marked 256, 254, 258. Most of the graves here are marked only with numbers, but inside the ground here are people's mums, dads, brothers, sisters, and even children. This giant burial site in the city of Izium only discovered when Ukrainian forces pushed Russian troops out of this northeasterly region. The site now a symbol of Russia's brutality in Ukraine. Well, this is one of the grimmest scenes you can ever witness. 
One of the investigators has just written on this body bag, 92, anonymous man. The area becoming a giant crime scene. Forensic teams carefully exhuming hundreds of dead bodies from the ground. Ukrainian officials saying many of the victims met a violent death and some of the bodies show signs of torture. Well, the forensic team here have just removed the body of a man from one of the unmarked graves, and it's obvious that he had his hands tied behind his back. The anguish of relatives like Ludmilla, impossible to comprehend. So Ludmilla is showing us to the grave of her husband. She says so many people have died. Too many people, she says. Ludmilla's husband killed by an airstrike in the days after Russia invaded. Written on a piece of paper in Ludmilla's hand are numbers. Okay. So Ludmilla says numbers 27 and 107 that she's written on this piece of paper. She doesn't know which of those numbered graves her mother-in-law's body could be in. Adding to the pain and confusion, the fact that some graves here contain more than one body. This was a mass grave that contained the bodies of Ukrainian soldiers. It's written on the wooden cross which marked it, 17 men from Izium from the morgue, and prosecutors say that one of the bodies showed signs of torture. But most of those buried here are civilians, and we found the graves of children too. So two girls aged six and nine. Prosecutors investigating how the most innocent died. Yevgen, do we know how these children were killed? As Russian forces moved into Izium, this building was badly bombed, killing those sheltering inside. More than 40 people were killed in this apartment block when it was struck in the early days of the war. Entire families wiped out. And we're told many of the victims are buried in that mass burial site in the forest nearby. You were in the building when it was hit. Uh, this is my apartment. We met Sergei, who was inside with his mum when the missiles landed, killing so many of his neighbours and friends. People who died in your apartment block are buried in the forest. How does that make you feel? I feel nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Every day we saw bodies, parts of bodies. I feel nothing. You're used to it after six months of war. Addressing the UN, President Zelensky comparing the killing in Izium to the atrocities in Bucha when Russian forces retreated from areas near Kiev in the spring, saying the only difference was that victims in Izium were buried, whereas in Bucha they were scattered on the streets. How can we allow the Russian army somewhere on Ukrainian soil, knowing that they are committing such mass murders everywhere? We cannot. And like Butcher, the horror stories in Izium only coming to light because the Russians retreated. Russian flags now in the trash and placed under the doormat into the mayor's office. The Ukrainian flag flying again. For months in Izium, no running water, no electricity and no gas. People here are in need. Well, you can hear and see how desperate these people are for humanitarian aid. They've been living under Russian occupation for months and they still live close to the front line. Waiting in line, Tanya, a mum, getting food. Tanya, what was life like under the Russians? It was unbearable, she tells us. The Russians would just appear, point a gun at you and threaten to shoot. And on the outskirts of the city, Ukrainian troops removing Russian tanks, abandoned when Russian forces fled. Well, the Ukrainian offensive has taken thousands of square miles of territory all around here. But as you can see, the Ukrainian military very active in this area. Soldiers also clearing up near the burial site, removing explosives left by Russian troops. And this, the first time Volodymyr is able to visit the graves 
of three members of his family. They died in an airstrike, he told us, from Russian fascists. What is your feeling towards the people, the Russians, that did this? Hate, he says. Anger and hate. Just identifying some of the bodies will be hard. The workload for Ukrainian prosecutors, overwhelming. Nikolai, what's it like to work here, to do this job? Alexander arriving here looking for answers, holding a photo of his son. A son called Alexander. His son, also called Alexander, went missing a month ago when Russian soldiers raided his apartment. Alexander's son, Alexander, had picked up a Ukrainian military jacket that he found, and potentially that was the only crime he committed in the eyes of the Russian authorities. People in Izium telling us that the Russians ruled through fear and violence. For months, this burial site covering up their alleged crimes. Now, the truth is being dug up. But if more of their land is liberated from the Russians, Ukrainian officials believe they will discover a pattern of death and killing again. What an unbelievably dark time for that country. Our thanks to Tom for his careful and thoughtful reporting. Still ahead here on Prime, the fear of gun violence has transformed how we live and what precautions are taken to keep us safe. We test gun detecting devices to see how well they work. And if you missed it in theaters the first time, you may get to see it again. We take a look at why movies are returning to the box office by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, ESPN and reminding us of the history made 30 years ago. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay, we made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. 
They say what's old is new again. In this case, what's old is viewed again. Get your popcorn ready. Here is the big screen re-release by the numbers. It's been nearly 13 years since James Cameron's original avatar transported moviegoers to Pandora, racking up $2.8 billion in ticket sales, a box office record that stands today. If you missed the 3D experience before or just want to see it again, ABC parent company Disney has re-released Avatar this weekend, remastered by Cameron in 4K and with new sections at a stunning 48 frames per second. Producers are building anticipation for the long-awaited sequel, Avatar, The Way of Water, which is scheduled to hit theaters in just 84 days on December 16th. Who is counting? We are. It'll be just in time for the holidays. Avatar is not alone. The re-release has become a mini-movie trend. Spider-Man No Way Home was back in theaters earlier this month, featuring an extra 11 minutes of never-before-seen Marvel magic. Steven Spielberg's Jaws also took a bite out of the nostalgia with Universal offering an IMAX option over Labor Day weekend, 47 years after the original on-screen shark scare. And in November, the Kevin Costner and Whitney Houston romance The Bodyguard will return to the marquee, three decades since its 1992 premiere and setting up the late singer's biopic I Want to Dance with Somebody later this year. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. An often taboo topic in the Latino community, mental health the push to make treatment more accessible. And it's a question many of us ask, what will the future be like? Dr. Steven Novella tells us about the predictions in his new book and the critical choice we'll have to make. But first, here's a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. so much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. The East Coast 
coast of Canada bracing for what could be one of the strongest storms to hit the country. Wow, this one is going to pack quite the punch. Hurricane Fiona racing up the Atlantic after passing Bermuda, where at least 70% of the island is without power. Power crews won't be sent out until the storm is gone, but officials say they're prepared. This is the time where Bermudans depend on us, and we will rise and make sure that they are protected and that they get turned on as soon as possible. Fiona blamed for at least eight deaths across the Caribbean after first making landfall in Puerto Rico. More than 900,000 customers still without power there. No word on when it will be restored. As Russia readies new attacks in Ukraine, a new effort on the ground. Moscow forcing a false referendum vote on Ukrainians in four Russian-held regions until next Tuesday. The referendum results all but certain to favor the Kremlin, worrying the West that Russia will use them as a ploy to defend nuclear retaliation. Car traffic crawling at the Russia-Finland border. And Putin has his speech. Uh, I just pack my bag. In those long lines, many Russian men hoping to safely cross and escape the call to war. This is totally rigged. It's an absolute total fraud. Internet conspiracy theorist Alex Jones in court in Connecticut today for the penalty phase in the defamation suit against him. Jones was found financially liable for repeatedly claiming the 2012 school shooting at Sandy Hook was a hoax and that parents of the children killed were actors. Jones said he does not have the money to pay a penalty to the plaintiffs. Doesn't matter they do a $500 billion verdict, a $10 trillion verdict, a $50 million verdict. You can't get blood out of a stone. Boeing will pay $200 million over charges that investors were misled about the 737 MAX's safety after two deadly crashes. The SEC saying in times of crisis and tragedy, it is especially important that public companies and executives provide full, fair, and truthful disclosures to the markets. Boeing responding saying, we have made broad and deep changes across our company in response to those accidents and have enhanced our culture of safety, quality, and transparency. But still, many of the families of those kills, they do not think this is enough. The two crashes killed 346 people. As the fentanyl epidemic tightens its grip on communities across the country, school officials now sounding the alarm about children being targeted. Recent data has documented that we've seen about a 40% increase in the number of deaths among teenagers and young adults. Fentanyl, a synthetic opioid, is considered 50 times more potent than heroin. And the alert comes as the LA Unified School District, the second largest in the nation, announced they'll now stock up on Narcan in every school K through 12. The DEA now warning that younger children are now being targeted by dealers. These colorful pills, known as rainbow fentanyl, are made to look like candy, and dealers are able to set up the sale via social media. Animal lovers looking for a way to make some cash can now sign up for a new app dubbed the Airbnb of private dog parks. The app's called Sniff Spot, and it lets people rent their yard to dog owners. Most sniff spot locations cost between $5 to $15 an hour per dog, but it's unclear who picks up after the pooches. The daily drumbeat of gun violence happening in schools, malls, and even houses of worship across the country has changed the way we live. It's led some businesses and other places that attract large crowds to invest in ways to screen people and spot guns before they get inside. ABC's Jay O'Brien has a look at one of these popular gun detecting devices and sees if it really works. To get inside every one of the 27 Six Flags parks across North America, well, the Six Flags. visitors now have to walk through one of these, an Evolve Express scanner. Any place that's open to the public has to have a plan. Jason Freeman, the company's head of safety and security, made the decision to install them at his amusement parks two years ago. We don't want somebody coming into our parks that may have a nefarious agenda. Have a Six Flags day. Designed to spot hidden handguns, knives, and even bombs, the machines use similar electromagnetic waves to a metal detector, but there's no line or X-ray for bags. Evolve co-founder Anil Chikara told us his company's scanners use advanced sensors and artificial intelligence to learn the subtle differences in density between your keys, for example, and a weapon. Bags on, holding hands, phones in their pocket, 
They're getting screened, but they don't realize it. Walking through an evolved scanner is increasingly becoming the price of entry at NFL stadiums, museums, and schools across the country. The whole idea is let the technology do the hard work with the security team overseeing it and let the visitors walk right through. We wanted to test it out. Anil was lit up with an alert, which along with his picture was sent to the Six Flags security team. The system had detected a metal prop hidden in Anil's waistband, mimicking the outline of a gun. But nothing I had in my pockets caused any concern. It didn't catch this, but it caught that. That's correct. But sometimes Evolve's scanners are set off by things that aren't weapons. ABC News obtained emails from one of the largest school districts in North Carolina. After Evolve scanners were installed there last spring, one principal complained the multi-million dollar rollout caused a day of chaos, with many students carrying no weapons but alerting the machines. The principal later wrote to a parent that metal three-ring binders tended to set off the system. In response, Evolve told us their technology is intended to find things that could be weapons and is constantly improving. Are there times where it will say something as a weapon when it's not? So the way the algorithms work is they get better over time. They're very good at under, understanding items of interest and alerting, and they're very good at understanding personal items and not alerting on them. Evolve's technology isn't meant to stop a gunman with an assault rifle. It's intended for smaller weapons carried into places that attract big crowds. That's the idea here in West Virginia's Fayette County. School Superintendent Gary Hoke told us his district would sometimes catch students with knives, even guns, in the hallways. But, he says, the Evolve scanners, which were installed last year after a grant from the company, have significantly reduced the number of weapons found on his campuses. It really is a deterrent. I mean, it's one more tool. Hoke told us the story of one student who tossed this pair of brass knuckles in a flower pot so they wouldn't be caught by the machines. And as schools reopen, it might not be long before you or your child walk through a scanner just like this one. We see schools adopting this technology so that the kids can focus on learning and the teachers can focus on teaching. Our thanks to Jay. We're also tracking several headlines around the world. Parents and family members of the 43 Mexican missing students gathered outside a military camp in Mexico City to demand answers about their abduction eight years ago. Protesters threw firecrackers at the military police and knocked down fences around the headquarters where four suspects of the abduction were arrested. At least 71 migrants died after the boat they were aboard sank off the Syrian coast. They were sailing from Lebanon, and the incident marks the deadliest voyage in recent memory from that nation. And cities in northern India have been impacted by flooding. Authorities have ordered schools to close and urged residents to work from home to avoid the floods. Experts blamed poor town planning and climate change. We want to shift to the mental health crisis among Latinos, an often taboo topic in the community. But with the help of social media, there is a new push to provide access to treatment by creating safe spaces to start a much needed conversation. A growing concern about mental health treatment in Latino communities. Stars like Selena Gomez and Jay Balvin launching their own platforms in hopes of providing greater access to mental health treatment. Even if it, it took me a minute to get into it, it's just there. And there's something that's really comforting about that. In 2021, research showed that more than 16% of the Latinx community reported having a mental health condition, with 20% of those labeled as serious. For example, symptoms of depression among Hispanics was 40.3% compared to 25.3% among whites. Therapists like Jacqueline Garcia are taking to TikTok, trying to change the stigma surrounding mental health. What are like some words of advice for someone that may be struggling? To begin these conversations with your family, your loved ones, your friends, and seeing how the, that language develops in your life. Because maybe you come from homes where 
this wasn't talked about. It was invalidated. Garcia also says there are ways to find a safe space online. There are more Latina creators out there that are talking about their own mental health struggles that provides more of a connection and safety for other people. Oh, you don't really express your emotions? I was like, yeah, that's me. One of those Latina creators, Kayla Suarez. In my house, we don't talk about it like at all. A teenager herself, she co-hosts Teenager Therapy, using the podcast to share her own mental health struggles. I think it's incredibly important to start talking about mental health to start breaking those generational curses of just like keeping everything bottled in. With more conversations, there is improvement. In 2017, around 8% of Latinos in the U.S. received mental health treatment or counseling. That number rising to nearly 11% in 2020. The 19-year-old says she's learned to put herself first. It can really just be one person in the family to make a shift in the way that your relatives are viewing things. So glad we could highlight uh, this this problem. And, you know, want to mention that culture-specific therapy is also so crucial. And uh, you know, she, she mentioned there, uh, Kayla mentioned that it's so important to have this conversation within your family. Social workers and therapists say the same thing. It starts at home, and if that's not an option for you, therapists say, find an outlet elsewhere with a therapy group, one-on-one -on -one sessions, or a legitimate counselor online. We want to shift now to Shakira. Superstar Shakira is speaking publicly for the first time about her tax fraud case and a recent breakup, sharing how she's found healing. ABC's Lama Hassan has the story. Singing sensation Shakira opening up, talking to Elle magazine about her current station in life, which she describes as, quote, probably one of the most difficult, darkest hours of my life. 45-year-old Super Bowl halftime star who this summer announced she was splitting from her long-term partner, Spanish soccer star Gerard Pique, with whom she shares two young sons, has also been accused of tax fraud by the Spanish government, something she denies, telling the magazine, I've paid everything they claimed I owed, even before they filed the lawsuit, so as of today, I owe zero to them. I'm confident that I have enough proof to support my case and that justice will prevail in my favor. Shakira, who is one of the best-selling artists of all time, finding success in both English and Spanish language music, is now fighting for custody of her two young boys. Telling Elle her sons are her main focus and protecting them is a priority. It's really upsetting for two kids who are trying to process their parents' separation. And sometimes I just feel like this is all a bad dream and that I'm going to wake up at some point. But no, it's real. She had this particular plea to be left alone, to grieve, uh, to be left alone to tend to her children. She really felt very strongly that she needed to protect her family and herself at this particular moment. Music now proving to be a salve for the singer. She says she's finding solace in her songs and is preparing to release her first album in five years. Our thanks to Lama Hassan. It is Friday, and instead of looking ahead to the weekend, let's look ahead to the distant future. What may our world look like, and how will technology transform humanity? That's the big question. We're hoping Dr. Stephen Novella can answer that for us. He's a neurologist and associate professor at Yale. He's also the host of the podcast, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and is out with a new book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. So walk us through your vision for technology in the distant future. So, I mean, there's a, obviously technology has been transforming our civilization, our everyday life. You know, it seems to be accelerating. You know, most of us alive today have lived through the digital revolution. It's hard to imagine what our own lives was like even 10, 20, 30 years ago. So we tried to, you know, look at the arc of technological history and see how, how can we extrapolate that into the future? Can we look ahead to 2050 or maybe 2100 and see where these technologies are going to be? And we also look at emerging technologies, things you may not be really aware of yet that are just about to change our world and talk about how that might happen. Do you foresee us living at some point in a Jetsons type world, flying cars, or yeah. is that just not realistic? 
So we, we take a, a, a long look at the futurism of the past, like in the previous attempts at imagining the future. Sometimes today, you know, we're living in, you know, the, the, the futurism of people before us. Um, and the, the, generally speaking, the, you know, the visions of the future don't line up with what's actually played out. They predict a lot of uh, progress that doesn't happen and they miss the real progress that happens. So we always imagine the future with flying cars and, and you know, robot butlers, of course, right? Uh, two things that have not yet happened. It's never gonna happen the way people imagine it. We, and that's, again, that's something else we try to figure out in the book, like, how, what kind of mistakes do people make in the past in terms of trying to imagine the future and how could we correct that? How could we do better by, by not making the same mistakes they made? And in the book, you mentioned that we have to be skeptical. Tell yeah. us a little bit more about that. Why should we be skeptical on the outlook of the future? Well, for a couple of things. One is we have to be humble about our ability to predict the future. And to be honest, like you can't really predict the future because there's nothing inevitable about the future. Uh, really, this is about how our choices will affect the future. Like we could be having different technology now than, than we currently have. If people in the past made different choices, we could all have have electric cars and be flying rockets instead of jets or whatever. So a lot of it is about saying, all right, what choices do we make, do our descendants make, and how will, could that play out? How could that affect the future and, you know, the medium term and in the longer term? And of course, we could, you could always predict some broad brushstrokes. Like we know computers are gonna get more powerful. We know that robots are gonna be a bigger part of our lives. We know that we're gonna be able to have more powerful control over our genetics and things like that. So there are things, some things are fairly predictable in the big picture and it's fun, a lot of fun to think about and to research how that might play out. In the book, you say technology will not save us from ourselves. We can use our technology to create or destroy, free or enslave, to enlighten or control. These are the choices that will dominate our future. So you emphasize the importance of critical thinking. How concerned are you about having both critical thinking and this excitement for technology? Yeah, well, that's what scientific skepticism is. That's what we do with our first book, with this book, is try to combine an enthusiasm about science, about technology, about where the future can take us, but at the same time acknowledge that we need to have, you know, a pretty realistic critical thinking, because not everything can can happen, not everything is going to happen. Uh, there's a lot of false claims, not only about what's happening now, but about you know, like what might be happening in the future. So you have to combine that knowledge with logic and critical thinking and humility, a lot of humility about how our brains will try to deceive us and how other people might try to deceive us. Um, and so you get at the end of the day, you get to the, that, I think, a really good combination of that enthusiasm with realism. And I think that's the only formula to try to sort through like all the possibilities that there are before us. Is there something that you're looking forward to in, in, in like that's te technological that could happen, probably won't happen, anything that you've got your eye on? So I think the one thing that, I'm, I'm, I'm a neurologist, right? So it's not surprising that I'm very interested in the, the future of neuroscience. One of the like, really exciting emerging technologies is a brain machine interface. You know, we're getting better and better at being able to have our you know, computers talk directly with our brains and control computers and therefore machines with our brains. And like the proof of concept research is all done. It's now we're just at the point that we just need incremental technological improvements. So again, we can predict, yeah, you know, we're gonna see this century, you know, the ability to have a matrix type of, you know, pretty detailed communication with machines. And that's, that's definitely gonna be a disruptive technology. I mean, you could live your life in a virtual reality, for example, I mean, going to the extreme end. But even short of that, like having people who are paralyzed be able to control their prosthetics, like robotic limbs, they seamlessly incorporate that into our, our brain and our ability to control it. That's happening now, and we could pretty much see where that's gonna go into the future. Exactly like you said, there those are advancements that are happening right now and mm -hmm. are likely uh, to continue on. It's fascinating to watch, fascinating to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. The Skeptic's Guide to the Future will be available September 27th, wherever books are sold. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Roger Federer teams up with Rafael Nadal for his last match, losing in doubles. It was an emotional moment for him, but...
probably uh, not the way he wanted to, to end his career, but it's been a successful one. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.